Well, hello, and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, and once again, we have this awesome privilege here on EWTN to hear, uh, I was talking before the show, to hear the gospel, to share the gospel as it continues to play out, right? Because there's the gospel proper there in Scripture, the, the life of our Lord, but then there's the gospel as it continues to be played out in the lives of of his beloved children. And so we're joined tonight by Sister Diana Marie Andrews, OP. She's a former Latter-day Saint, and she's now the vocation director of the Dominican Sisters of Hawthorne. Sister Diana, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming tonight. I'm really excited to hear your story, your vocation story, your background with the Latter-day Saints. I feel like we've talked to a number of, of uh, former Mormons lately, and mm-hmm. I've been getting to know that a little bit better. That's been a lot of fun. Yeah, good. So thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Okay. Uh, where does your story, your spiritual journey begin? Um, so I grew up in Utah in mm-hmm. a small town right in between Salt Lake and Provo. It's all called right. Alpine. I think it's on maps now, but um, <laughs> back then just very small and uh, a really wonderful upbringing. I think um, looking back, there was a lot of community support, and I think that part of that was that everybody around us was was LDS. We all kind of shared the same principles, the same beliefs, so it was very comfortable to grow up in that environment. Um, My parents worked a lot, so I actually had kind of a second family, so to speak, that we were around as well. So my parents were never that practicing. Um, They were both Mormon. My father had converted to marry my mom in the Mormon church. Um, But most of our church going was with kind of this other family that we're still very close to, and they're still all practicing LDS and my mom's side of the family is mostly all LDS as well. Um, so I think I think like a lot of people grew up just going to church and doing what we were told mm-hmm. and um, believing the things we were told to believe and just taking for granted that everything you're being taught was true. Mm-hmm. Um, it's That's what we do as children, right? We trust our parents and we receive from them. And um, so as we got older, um, continued to go to church, but it's it's funny because the LDS uh, faith, it's you're very active in it when you're active, but then there's no um, it's like Sunday obligation. So when I was with my parents more, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't always go to church on the weekends, but with this other family, we were very, very involved. Uh, family home evening, relief society, time at the church, um, all these different things, home visiting. Um, and I was getting to the age where I would have started getting into young women's and um, we're still having the Mormon churches three hours long. So when people <laughs> complain about long church services, I was like, no, yeah. no, these aren't long. <laughs> so we, uh, we always were part of that. And I shared the big part of the Mormon faith is, is having a testimony, right? That right. the church is true, that Joseph has found, founded this church and that he's prophet, that he, there were no other churches that were... Um, following the laws of God the right way. And so he founded the Mormon church. And that was something you get up and you share and you you testify to that. And a lot of the um, services were testimony meetings. So kind of sharing our faith, reinforcing each other in the faith. So, um, and there was a big emphasis on, um, I guess, feeling your faith for lack of a better word. So there's supposed to be a, a burning in the breast when the Holy Spirit was present and that would confirm for you that this or that was true. Um, but as we got older, uh, my family moved to California when I was about 15. So kind of right around the age, I would have um, probably started getting more and more involved of my right. own volition <laughs> yeah. rather than just following along. Uh, we moved to California for my parents' work. Now up to this so, point, you, know, you, you said you know, as a child, kind of just accepting and going along with the beliefs. Who would you say at that point that God was to you and that Jesus was to you? Where did that fit in sort of your universe? Yeah, I think, so God was like a bigger parent. (laughs) So if you follow the rules, then you don't get in trouble. And if you don't follow the rules, then you do get in trouble. And I think I sort of took it in also that um, if you do X, Y, and Z, you're a good person. If you do X, Y, and Z, you're a bad person. So there was a very sharp split between like good people and bad people, not just good actions and bad actions. the Mormon theology of the Trinity is very different. Right. Um, so the Holy Spirit is talked about a lot, kind of the Holy Ghost and how he moves in your life and confirms or deters different decisions. Um, but Jesus was uh, a deified man. So sort of a brother, friend, but not um, 
I don't really remember having any strong opinions or strong thoughts on, on Jesus. He was sort of one of us, but better, you know, and that's what we were headed for. Um, that was sort of my child's understanding. So it was mostly like God the Father who was uh, loving, but a rule maker. And then the Holy Ghost was the one who kind of helped you make choices. Right. So we're speaking tonight with Sister Diana Marie Andrews, OP, former Latter day Saint. And so your family moves out to California right at about the time that you would have perhaps begun getting more involved. Mm -hmm. And what, what happened next? Um, so once I lost that uh, fairly homogenous community around me, um, I also sort of lost my bearings with the church because so much of uh, my, my LDS upbringing was about the people that I went to church with, the families that I knew. It was that familiarity was just as much a part of what made me LDS as anything I believed. So once I lost that, um, I didn't know much about other religions, but I just sort of figured they were all the same. Um, so in order to make friends, because I didn't know anyone, we moved to Los Angeles. I was uh, not somebody who made friends right away very easily. So we got involved in a Presbyterian youth group, but it was mostly for social reasons. I, d I don't remember ever really worrying about what they believed. Um, it was like they had different music and their churches looked a little bit different and but they had a youth group where I could meet people so I mean does it really matter what they believe or you know so um, I did consider getting baptized in their church I don't remember why I didn't um, but it was really just like social reasons right. and it's the first time I'd gone I went to Europe also with them on a kind of a tour and we went to mostly Catholic places which is very different as a 17 year old Presbyterian. Yeah, yeah I mean, Catholicism <laughs> so, probably, was that even a, a known quantity at, up to that point? Well, you knew it existed, but it was something that people used to do. Ah. It's not something people really do now because we've thought through things, right? So we've, we've outgrown it. Right. But there's still some people do it, and it's interesting to go see the historical sites where people used to believe things. Um, and the beautiful architecture, the beautiful art. So even if you don't even if you know Catholicism is like a little crazy and a little old fashioned, uh, nobody really does it anymore. Um, still, it's churches are spectacular. Uh, you can't deny the beauty of those or the history of, of the different places we went. We went to a monastery in Spain, we went to St. Peter's. Um, but I just, it, none of it really, I knew they were sacred, but I never, there was nothing else there. I thought it was a lot of superstition. Uh, I was very disturbed by the people, you know, praying very devoutly on their knees or buying rosaries and having them blessed by this guy, like the Pope. I mean, who's he? Why does he get to bless stuff? Um, so I just thought that was kind of disturbing. But right. <laughs> um, and then so I think as I went on in high school and then through college more so, um, it, faith just became something that I probably would have said that I was... Uh, like sort of Christian, but I was very much, okay, I'm, I'm, I believe in something, but I don't need a, an organized religion to tell me. And I had met so many people from so many different denominations at that point that I kind of confirmed to me like, well, no, it doesn't matter <laughs> what you believe. You just kind of pick a church depending on where you live and how you're feeling and whether you like the music and the preaching or you don't go to any church and that doesn't affect your relationship right. at all as long as you believe in some sort of some creator somewhere right you know but um i think i thought of religion as something you you grow out of right you don't need it anymore it's like training wheels until you can start thinking for yourself right and um college definitely confirmed that did not have a lot of strong christian friends around me and unfortunately uh and i don't think this is all their fault the christians i did know i did not get along with i felt very uncomfortable around i felt like i was being judged and i was judging them so it was not a good dynamic yeah. um you know the it was like well why do you think you're better than me just because you meet for bible study on saturday night and i go out with my friends you know and it's you don't have that right to tell me what to do and uh very much getting caught up in that and um and there were so many different styles of it so it was like the people in the quad with like unfortunately very uh shall we say kind of like aggressive <laughs> evangelization techniques um, which just made me uncomfortable um, and then people who were like well I'm Christian but you can kind of do whatever you want you know 
And then the Catholics I met were uh, mostly, I guess, culturally Catholic. They really weren't practicing. I mean, they never went, they went to church as often as I did. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it was not, uh, not the best witness. And we were all sort of like, well, we're, you know, we're grownups now because we're all of 18. So we just, we were thinking for ourselves and um, not too caught up, but definitely the influence of kind of the Women's Center and that sort of uh, what it meant to be a woman and that gender roles and cultural roles were all restrictive and that, um, you know, they just sort of bring people down. And so um, a lot of that sort of influence just through the different classes I was taking, not because of any explicit like joining of a, of a club or anything. It was just sort of in the air. Right. Um, so I don't remember ever being extremely hostile to Christianity, but I was extremely dismissive of it. My friends and I made a lot of fun of it. Um, and unfortunately, other people who called themselves Christians also joined in on that, right? It's like, yeah, no, I don't really know why, you know, the church teaches this, but if I don't go to mass when I go home, mom's going to be mad. Um, I just didn't know a lot of people were like, actually, let's talk about this. Right. Let's have a real conversation. Um, so it just helps me kind of dismiss it yeah. more and more. Um, and it's all the rules, right? It was all rules. It was all judgment. It was all, and I think um, one of the things that was difficult as I learned more about the LDS beliefs uh, as I got older is that I was so startled to realize some of them didn't really agree with history and anthropology and some of the things that we really knew. Uh, my dad had left the Mormon church when, um, gosh, I think it was about eight or nine mm. because of his research. Um, his own study had led him to feel that uh, things that didn't match up with history and with anthropology and some of the um, some of the theology also just didn't, he couldn't believe right. those and profess that faith anymore. Um, my family also had some trouble with the, um, the idea of exactly how gender roles play out. Uh, they, I don't think there was nothing about, you know, everybody has to be all the same doing things, but this, I, uh, there was a very strong sense that, um, we had gotten, I guess, in our childhood, a lot of, like, you only can be a wife and a mother. That's the only thing you can do that will matter. Um, and my mom is a physician, my father's physician. And so they had obviously found other ways to serve with their gifts. Um, and so it was, there's some tension there as well. So right. um, as I learned more, I think that all that started taking on more weight in terms of, okay, maybe this doesn't make sense. Maybe this is not true. Um, learning a little bit more about Joseph Smith's personal history was very problematic for me. Right. Um, and that was, that was hard, but I think instead of thinking through it, I just sort of pitched religion generally. It was because I didn't see any difference, right? So what I had grown up with, it just was, fell under the umbrella of organized religion. So I just got rid of all of it. Just like, this is all nonsense. Um, and that if you really strongly believe it, you obviously aren't thinking for yourself. Um, you're unreasonable and judgmental. And uh, that's not the best way to start relationships with people is just assuming they're judging you all the time. <laughs> so I surrounded myself with people who agreed with me, who, you know, we all felt the same way. And then the more I studied history, the more I saw uh, some of the flaws in the church's history, some not so high points. And that also confirmed that. Um, and then it also, I think, made it even more distant, where it's like, well, this is something people used to do when they also, you know, didn't believe in germ theory and didn't, um, you know, they thought the world was flat and all these things that, that uh, you sort of judge history for. And it's like, you know, as if you've never been wrong about anything. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, how could they ever believe that? It's, I mean, especially now as a convert, you look back and you're like, oh, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to believe things that aren't true. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but it, it became just sort of this this thing other people did, and uh, I was going to be free of that and just sort of make my own way and wanted to find a good job and find um, a boyfriend and, and have good friends, and that was kind of the whole goal, you know, um, to live a good life and not hurt other people and to find something that made me happy. Um, 
The problem, of course, looking back is that everything that's supposed to make you happy is outside of you and it's all in the future. Right. <laughs> right? right. And so if a relationship falls apart, it's the end of the world because all your happiness was placed in that person, was in that, that thing. Um, if you get bad grades, it's the end of the world. If you don't have the job that you think is going to make you happy, it all falls apart really quickly. Um, but I just thought it's because I was doing it wrong, right? It's like, well, next time it'll be better. You know, it'll, it'll improve. I just, that this, this didn't happen to be the right boyfriend, job, class, major, whatever it was. So um, that was pretty much like all through college. Um, and then into graduate school. I went to graduate school in Washington, D.C. And um, that I think was even more of a, um, like a concentrated environment of religion is something other people do. And my mom sends me emails about and <laughs> a lot right. of for Facebook messages. Yeah, exactly. Like the, <laughs> and it's unfortunately it was a lot of like the well-intentioned mother that I see now who's trying to love her son. But the emails were right. those like, you know, Jesus loves you. And if you don't forward this to 10 different people, then um your salvation is at stake. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> how, how did those two things go together? Uh, so that didn't help anything. Um, and then I think also in college, I had gone to some different denominations. So like at one point I was going through a really uh, difficult time and I went to church and there was so little to sort of support me. And they, they talked about heaven a lot, but there was no it was like, right, but I'm still here right now and I'm like, things are not good and I'm not happy. And so what's what's going on with this? And like, how do I live here and now? And it was just like, we'll just be good. And then heaven will come and things will get better. And I was like, I don't think I can wait that long, you know? And so my friend's suggestion was like, well, don't go to church anymore. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good because that made me feel worse. So <laughs> I went okay. to one Catholic mass. I was uninspiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went to write a paper though, so I probably wasn't really in the worship mindset. I was <laughs> taking a psychology of religion class. And so I went to mass and I was like, this is super weird. These people are weird and they all stand up and sit down together and they all talk at the same time, but they mumble. So I have no idea what they're saying. And the, the guy up there who was the priest is talking about football and I don't get that either. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's like, what do all these things have to do together? Um, so just not nothing kind of really inspiring religion-wise. So I got kind of into yoga and that kind of thing. A friend of mine was going through, unfortunately, a very uh, difficult divorce. And I was going through another breakup. And so we started doing yoga together because it was like, okay, self-care. That's what's going to be the answer, right? It's just like taking care of yourself and attentiveness to the world and kind of being a good person and all of those things. It's like, okay, this, this is going to be what answers all the questions. And my, my father had gotten into Eastern religion, so he's sort of, sort of identifies as Buddhist, um, as well as my sister. And uh, my mom is no longer really practicing, but still identifies as LDS. So there was, I mean, in my family, certainly nobody's going to be like, well, no, no, you can't do that <laughs> because we're all doing different things. Right. So... Um, that helped for a little while. Um, <laughs> it got me through like the worst part of, of that particular relationship ending and uh, kind of helped me focus on graduate school. But um, it was so impersonal. I think that was the hard thing is like you're communing with the universe. And I didn't, I mean, how do you even, how do right. you do that? I wouldn't have known how to phrase it at the time, but to realize you can't have a relationship with a thing or a, even a group. You have to have a relationship yeah. with a person, a one-on-one. -on -one. There's certainly some so. some right, like now that we would say as Catholics, there's some right threads and directions mm -hmm. there. There's this self-emptying, there's this this focus and presence, but it's self-emptying to be filled by what? Yeah. Present to whom, right? And that's, so it's missing, it's exactly. missing the rest. You know, and I sure. think that's what... I mean, looking back, you're grateful because you see the Lord at work and kind of setting these right. pieces in place where, because <clears throat> I know that, I mean, jumping ahead a little bit, I know that was a concern coming into the church. It's like, do I have to say that everything happened before was just a waste? Right, right. And no, absolutely mm -hmm. not, because it's one story. It's right. one full story. It's not just 
God waiting for your life to start. <laughs> right. And God's not confined you know. to, an, like, all truth is God's truth. Yeah. Right? And so there's, there's right. little scraps of it all over the place. Exactly. You're at. And you run into it and you can and you can kind of hold on to that piece for a little bit. But then as you keep moving forward, if you're asking questions, then you start to realize, like, well, there's got to be something more than more. just this little piece. Right that I have, but I don't want to lose this either. You know, there's something good here. So um, as graduate school went on, um, I think I, I just trying to do well in school. I wanted to work at museum. I was doing pretty well with that, but still just so anxious all the time. Like just not, not settled and um, didn't really know why. Once again, just thought it's like, well, it's something out there. I'll get it eventually. You know, it's just an accomplishment that I need to uh, to get to. Um, if I work hard enough, I'll be happy. Um, and I started seeing someone who identified as Catholic. Um, at the time, I was so impressed by what I saw as his faith and his reliance on God. And um, looking back, I was not actually a practicing Catholic. <laughs> mm. but, uh, but the first person around me who willingly and openly spoke about God, uh, which was I was sort of embarrassed for him initially. It was kind of like, well, you know, you're not really supposed to tell people that, right? Like that's, you do your own God thing, but stop saying it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> kind of embarrassing me. Um, but I didn't want to be judgmental. So I did like a little interview. I'm like, you don't believe like these things, right? I mean, because I know some Catholics believe those and they were really, really big ones. They're like, um, you know, pro-life stuff and um, the like some of the other social issues and um, like things the Holy Father had said about like family planning and on different topics that were kind of hot, bush, hot button social issues. And, and he's like, oh, no, 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 those, those are optional. Like, I don't, I don't believe those. So it's like, okay, good. We can go on a date. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's very, you know, being very open-minded. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we started seeing each other and the more I um, was dating him, the more I thought, well, it seems like this might go somewhere, so I should learn something about what he believes. And he never really seemed willing to kind of get into what the church thought. It was it was your choice, right? So you pick and choose what you believe, and you don't always have to agree with the Holy Father, and you don't always have to uh, believe what the church teaches. And but you like try to go to mass and be a good person. I was like, mm, okay, well, so it's like every other <laughs> every other church I belong to. Um, and so the more we saw each other, the more uh, sort of curious I became about um, different things. So we'd gone to mass a few times and I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I was, I have to laugh looking back because uh, most of the masses that I initially went to just by happenstance ended up being um, not in English. So it's like ah. went to mass in Italy with him. He was stationed over in Italy, so I went to visit him. Or, uh, or Latin, because that was just the time that we could go. Um, <laughs> and I think that the Lord allowed that to let the beauty of it wash over me, the beauty of the buildings, the beauty of the music, um, the flowers, the incense. Um, because as soon as I started going to Mass in English, I started arguing with every, <laughs> every little thing. Um, but I, I wasn't really interested in becoming Catholic. I just kind of wanted to learn a little bit more. So when, when I visited him in Italy, I think that was kind of a, a turning point because for me, I'm just going to visit my boyfriend in Italy. I mean, who, like, it's an excuse to go to Italy. Why wouldn't you go, you know? And I'd been with my Presbyterian youth group, so I thought, well, this will be beautiful. And I uh, ended up at St. Peter's near the end of the trip, and he had gone to park the car. And I went in, and I wanted to see the Pieta again because I was so impressed that somebody could make stone look just like fabric and it's just a beautiful piece of art uh, and I went in and I went up to it and I just burst into tears and I'm not really like a public crier <laughs> I don't just sort of not prone to that not really yeah, yeah. Um, and I I didn't really know why I was crying um, and he came up and I yeah, feel bad for him now he's just like what happened like we were fine like 15 minutes ago and I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't our Lord. It wasn't the fact that He was dead. It was something about Our Lady. It was her face, and um, we 
kept going. We kind of walked around St. Peter's, which has so much beautiful art. It's not like the Pieta is the only thing in the Basilica. Mm. And I just couldn't stop talking about it. I, w I just was so distracted the whole time. I don't even remember what we looked at. And uh, I think in a moment of frustration, he said, what is it about that statue? What, I mean, why are you, why can you not stop talking about this? And I said, I don't know, I have no idea what this means, but that's what love looks like. Somebody took love and they carved it in stone and wow. that's what it looks like. Wow. And he said, well, you know, it's nice. <laughs> and then we went and had dinner. Uh, and then I went home and I promptly forgot about the whole thing, right? It was, the tears were because of jet lag and I just wrote the whole thing off, didn't, didn't think about it again. Um, so I went along my merry way, kind of making my plans, finishing graduate school. And then he came home from Italy and uh, went to graduate school himself. And I thought, well, I still would like to know a little bit more about what we're doing. Because when he got back, he said, I really feel like I should go to mass a little bit more. So, um, but once again, he wouldn't answer any of my questions. He was kind of like, oh, everybody has to do this. You know, it's their own journey. It's their own, like, I, I can't give you the answers to this stuff. And I don't know if he didn't know or if he really was just unwilling to talk about it. Um, so I started to um, just look around a little bit and uh, ended up at a parish we had gone to that I thought was beautiful and had the same inscription around the nave as at St. Peter's. And I loved St. Peter's, so I thought, well, that seems like a good sign. Uh, and it's bright, like it's a beautiful white uh, inside interior, it's very light. Um, and I didn't contact the RCA people because I was not going to be Catholic. Um, I contacted the person teaching adult Sunday school because I was like, well, I'm an adult and it's a class on faith and reason and faith is unreasonable, so if nothing else, will this be very interesting. <laughs> and uh, I can just get a book recommendation from this guy and then I can just kind of go and do what I need to do on my own and not get involved with all these people and all their opinions and I'll just do it on my own. Um, so I emailed him and ended up being one of the Dominican friars from the House of Studies. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the Lord has a sense of humor. So <laughs> let's, let's take a break right mm -hmm. there and we'll come back out because that sounds like bad news in terms of... Yeah. <laughs> In terms of your expectations at that point in your story. It ruined all my plans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, God does that sometimes. <laughs> so we'll, we'll be right back okay. and we'll finish up that story. Again, yeah, we'll be right back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Sister Diana Marie Andrews' story, former Latter-day Saint. She's the vocation director of the Dominican Sisters of Hawthorne. And uh, you can check out more about the Hawthorne Sisters at hawthorne-dominicans.org. We'll see you just in a couple minutes. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight, hearing a great story from Sister Diana Marie Andrews O.P., former Latter-day Saint. Uh, she's the vocation director of the Dominican Sisters of Hawthorne. Uh, Sister, really been enjoying your story. Um, when we left off, I, I, I got in there and got us to do our break right at this crucial moment where we just, <laughs> you know, the alarm bells are sounding, right? You thought you were going to go to this Catholic parish and just get you know, a little a book recommendation just so you could skim the surface and, and you got yeah. hooked up with a, a Dominican friar. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened What happened with that? Uh, I, he was very, you know, very polite, uh, and but offered me a few other options besides just getting a book. And I didn't want to offend him. So right off the bat, I was like, I think the Catholic Church is like some nice things about it, but I don't know if I really want to be Catholic. So uh, just to warn you, right, that that's kind of where I am. I'm not all in. So don't, go crazy. Um, and he had been um, somebody who was raised Catholic but had left the church for a little while and came back. So uh, he understood kind of where where you are when you're just questioning and you're not quite sure, but I uh, just want to ask some questions. And so he offered me several different uh, possibilities. So he did give me books, given me many books over the years. Um, <laughs> but also offered RCIA, said it's not 
you don't have to become Catholic if you enter RCA, but you have a lot of basic questions. So, um, and offered to let me come to a baptismal prep class that he was teaching just to learn about baptism and uh, kind of started, very slowly started teaching me that was fundamental to the Christian life and, um, and then offered to meet with me. And I think that was one of the things that made the biggest difference was that he offered to tell me a little bit about his story and then just let me ask questions. And um, even from that first meeting, um, I still wasn't, it wasn't the sort of immediate, you know, all of a sudden I just like, yes, absolutely, I want to be Catholic. Um, it was more a real excitement that somebody was willing to answer my questions and that there were answers that were, were very intriguing. I didn't know if they were true yet, right. but they were really interesting. And there was uh, an openness there. Um, it wasn't like, oh, you have to be a member of the club before we talk to you about these things. You know, it was, it was yes, ask questions, learn whatever you'd like, talk to me about the things you're wondering about. Um, and I had so many more questions than I realized. Um, and it was really, it was just really exciting to have somebody encourage me to think, yeah. to ask questions. And I had a, sort of an emotional draw towards it. And I thought it was the same draw towards beauty that I had always had right, to the Pieta, to the um, Latin chant, to different things that you hear even in history classes or in architecture tours in, you know, on when you're traveling around Europe. Uh, I thought, well, of course beauty inspires that in people, but um, there was also a beauty to just what he was saying to, to kind right. of, it's like, oh, I want that to be true, but I don't, I don't know. It sounds a little too good to be true. And I don't want to believe something that's not true, but I want something that's satisfying both emotionally and intellectually, although I don't know if I would have phrased it that way. Um, and I started to just get inklings that maybe there was something here. And I knew I had to look more, and I, it was certainly a grace, but um, I trusted him pretty much right away, which is unusual for me. <laughs> I tend to be pretty skeptical. Um, so I, but I trusted that he really meant what he was saying. Some of the things I thought were like a little crazy, but he yeah. was sincere. So he talked a little bit about the Eucharist and uh, sort of these odd moments where he's like, do you know what a tabernacle is? I was like, yeah, it's the building in Salt Lake where the choir sings from. And he's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's different. Right, right, <laughs> so right. a little few road bumps there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, it was something I knew I had to kind of keep talking about, keep looking into. A different, again, I'm, I'm kind of struck. We can t maybe talk more about it later, but you know, that there is a different mode that you hadn't experienced, uh, someone who's talking in terms of propositional belief, like this is what I believe to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, not merely an emotional appeal, but not also not, not kind of a dismissive of truth, ending up in kind of just this, well, we all just kind of pick and choose and it doesn't really matter. Like someone mm -hmm. who will talk in terms of, hey, you may not believe this, but here are the things that I believe are true. Yeah. That's a breath of fresh air to it a is, mind that's yeah. seeking. Right? Even when you disagree with them, right. it was like, I don't know what I believe yet, but I know you believe this. Yeah. And it was not, there was nothing um, like confrontational about it. Right. He was so happy that I had questions and I, I hadn't been around Christianity like that before. Um, unfortunately, my experience at LDS church was very much, um, you could ask some questions, but questions weren't really encouraged. Um, I had, had several friends who were former missionaries and they got home from their missions they had a lot of questions and um, most of them were did not get a good response and m many of them left the church because of that and that was um, it was really hard you know because you want to think you want to to know to understand and um, the more of the friars I got to know, they were all kind of like that. They're like, yeah, questions are great. And now I know this is like their wheelhouse, you know, and they're like, <laughs> yeah. ah, yes, this is, <laughs> this is exactly what we're training for. And, um, but at the time it was just such a sincere, welcoming um, environment to explore and to understand and to read. And um, so I, I kept meeting with him. He introduced me to some people from the parish. I did start going to RCIA um, 
and I probably asked a lot of really obnoxious questions, <laughs> but I especially was just able to ask him a bunch of questions about everything, right? Social issues, resurrection of the body, um, abortion was a big stumbling block for me. Um, I remember the first time he spoke to me about the Trinity and I just, oh my gosh, I could not believe what I was hearing. And it was one of the first times in my life that I, I didn't need to understand it. I didn't need to be able to like nail it down and say like, okay, this is, it was just, it was like, there's something here that is going to shape my entire life if I let it. Um, there's I, just the theology and the relationships there. And I just couldn't, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was, you know, it was one of these was like, we should tell other people about this. And, you know, <laughs> first time RSA teachers are like, we're trying, you know, <laughs> I was like, other people don't know this. So you tell people, why do you not? Like, <laughs> It's in books, like we yeah. <laughs> the other churches believe this for thousands of years, but yeah, but I thought we were just like this was a secret, but I that was um that was life changing and then our our lady was always kind of there, so that first encounter with her um just stayed with me, and she was she was easy for me. I know that's not how it is for a lot of converts, but she just made perfect sense, and she was such a gentle constant presence for me. Um, looking back, the two scriptures I always think of for her are, um, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? You know, Elizabeth's words at the visitation. Yeah. Um, but also this passage in Joshua that um, where the, they're being told to follow the Ark of the Covenant. And he, they're given the reason why, which, you know, God doesn't always do. He's just really, you need to do this so that it's better for you. <laughs> but he said, because you've never been this way before. And I don't want you to get lost. And that's, I think, the role she played for me is that I'd never been this way before. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't, I still really struggled with sort of God as a father. And um, and then our Lord, as we, you get into the better theology, but it was still like, I don't want to just follow a bunch of rules. You know, I want to love someone. I want to have freedom you know, I don't want it to just be like, okay, if you join this church, you're just going to, there's all these rules you have to follow again. If you don't follow them, you're a bad person. If you do follow them, you're a good person. Because that was something else that had led me away from Christianity before, which is I had been raised to believe that you didn't do certain things. And if you did do them, you were a bad person. And I met all these people who were doing these things, <laughs> but I really liked them, right? They were fun to be around. They were, they were nice people. They were doing the best they could. And so it just helped me once again, like throw it all out. It's like, well, this doesn't make sense with what I'm experience, experiencing with this person. And so I think um, the way that I got to know people at my parish, a very vibrant, um, wonderful parish, but with a wide range of people in it. Um, and then getting to know the Dominican friars um, was probably the first time that, so I had known people who did good things, but didn't believe anything. And then I'd known people who professed a faith, but they didn't live it. And it was the first time that I saw both of those things together, that people professed a faith and they lived it and wanted to talk about it. And if they didn't have the answer, they were still happy you asked the question and you could, you could talk to them more about it. Um, and the other thing that made a huge difference to my conversion was um, the saints. Um, I'm kind of a backwards convert, I guess. Our Lady and the Saints <laughs> were the first thing I was comfortable with, and yeah. uh, the other things had to come later. <laughs> um, but I, I just wasn't comfortable around other Christians. I spent a little while in RCA trying to figure out how I could be Catholic without identifying as Christian, because I just still felt like Christians <laughs> are judgmental, Christians are this, you know, the kind of the bumper sticker Christianity or the the idea it's like, okay. People say, well, like, the Lord loves me. And I'm like, right, but I can't stand you. <laughs> so how do I can, how do I put those two things together? Um, and to sort of get away from that. And I remember one analogy was um, uh, <laughs> the deacon I was talking to, I was uh, ranting about this one day. And he said, are you mad when you go to a hospital and there are sick people? I was like, well, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> He's like, the church is a hospital for sinners. That's, that's what the church is. It's not a club for perfect people. And that doesn't mean that we don't have strong teachings and that there aren't things that we say, yes, this is, this is moral and this is immoral. That's not what that means, but it means we're all on the way. 
Right. <laughs> right. That's why confession is a beautiful mercy. That's why we receive frequent communion. That's because we're all on the way. We're not done. So to expect everybody around you to be done so that they can support you while you work yeah. out your stuff, that doesn't make sense, you know? Right. And so that helped a lot. Um, but probably the, the most important saint was St. Right. Mary Magdalene. Um, just became a really big part of my life very quickly. Um, I first learned about her from the Da Vinci Code. So the Lord can use anything. <laughs> so that's yeah. why people get stressed out. Like, oh, there, there's just no sign of hope for this person. Like, yeah, just wait. Like, yeah. the Lord will use something. Just, just pray for him. He will, yeah, he there's always use. always yeah. hope. Um, and I became interested in from that. And then I asked this the deacon that I was talking to about it, and he said, "Well, <laughs> I'll have somebody talk to you about her um, if you read the Gospel of Mark." It was like a, a carrot at the end of the stick, you know, because yeah. he knew I wasn't going to pick up the Bible on my own. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, she took matters into her own hands and her relics came from the first time from France oh, to wow. the Dominican House of Studies. And uh, so I have read the Gospel of Mark since then. But <laughs> at that time, I was like, yeah, no, she, she's doing this on her own. So I don't, <laughs> I don't have to read this yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The scriptures were very intimidating for me because I didn't understand. And I was looking at them at a history text right. for a historical context I didn't understand. So I felt a lot of pressure to uh, know more than I did. Right. So it was a bit of a challenge. But um, but she came to the House of Studies and her relic is is the her leg bone. Hmm. So it's a fairly large reliquary. And um, once again, I don't know why I wasn't freaked out by relics because it's it's a bit of a interesting part of, yeah. of our, you know, things we, we do as Catholics. Um, but I remember going up to the relic and immediately, it was in a locution, it wasn't like a bright white light, but immediately knowing from her teaching me somehow uh, that she, when she met the Lord, she knew that he loved her. She knew she couldn't live without that love and she knew she didn't deserve it all at once. Wow. And I realized during RCI, I had been struggling with the fact that you just, you want to earn it so bad. <laughs> you want to earn the Lord's love. And then the more you learn about sin, the more you realize, like, I'm not as good as I thought I was. <laughs> and I really am not okay. Because um, that was part of the reason I felt comfortable starting RCIA is that I was fine. I didn't need anything. Right. Right. I had the boyfriend. I had a job. Um, I actually never invited the boy my boyfriend at the time to come with me because I wanted to do it on my own. I didn't, I was like, well, I already know I like him. So looking back, it's interesting because I didn't want him to be a part of it. <laughs> and that's not really normal for somebody you're planning on having a life with. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to do it on my own. Um, and, but it was, the more I learned, the harder it became to say, okay, I, I desire this love that I'm being taught about, that I'm being told is real, but I feel like I need to earn it. And the more I learn, the more that I can't earn it. And that some of the things I've done that I thought were okay were not okay. And that's uh, it's just really hard when you're, when you're st first starting to go down that road to find that balance between mercy and truth and uh, what you can do on your own power and what you right. can't. And um, she sort of took over that part of my life for me. And made it okay to just be weak and tearful at his feet. There are a lot yeah. of tears during our CIA, <laughs> a <laughs> lot of crying. <laughs> but to realize that whatever else happened and whoever, whatever I had done and whatever I would do, I wanted to be at his feet for all of it. Um, she really took over that and she's still, she's still a big part of my life. So she kind of takes over when she needs to. Oh, that's um, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So, and she helped me find my vocation after. Yeah. Him. Well, um, let's, yeah, how, how did, what, uh, I mean, did you, did you go all the way through RCAA and become yes. Catholic? Okay. Yeah, so I, once I realized that this was true, uh, after a lot of kicking and screaming, I uh, realized I did need to actually be Catholic and I believed all of it. There was a consistency there that was important. Yeah. Um, and I, he, I mean, God bless this, he's a priest now, but um, he let me just emails and emails and emails of just questions. I mean, everything from abortion to why do we need our bodies at the resurrection to, I mean, I asked a lot of questions and read a lot and that helped. Um, but at the end of the day, it was 
all of the things together, all of the true things. So the beauty had become the beauty of the truth that they gave all of the emotions sort of a, a root yeah. and a place to, to be sustained, not just a passing impression. And, and then the recognition that if you actually believe these things, certain things need to change, um, how to go from like old life to new life. Because not everything in the old life was bad. And so what do you, how do you find that balance? One need to know beforehand, right, how to do that exactly how it was going to look. I wanted the plan, yeah. which the Lord doesn't give you. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I uh, finally ended up deciding to just go all the way through all of it um, because I was sitting in holy hour at our parish. Um, adoration was, oh my gosh, that was like the Trinity for me. It was like these moments of like, people do this? Like everybody should do this. Yeah, Things would be better. Um, and I was sitting in adoration, praying the rosary, um, talking to the Lord about why I couldn't be Catholic. <laughs> Some of us take longer than others. Um, <laughs> and I was very sincere explaining to him, like, this is never going to work. Like, I'll do this. I will pray the rosary. I will come to the parish. I'll help with things. I'll keep reading. I'll keep learning, but I can't become Catholic. And, uh, Eventually, the only thing I could hear in my own head was, be baptized, we'll figure everything else out later. Get baptized, we'll figure everything else out later. Yeah. And I went to um, the deacon I was talking to. I was like, something weird happened. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. So, and then that was kind of a turning point and helped me kind of make myself, make it all the way in. Um, so 2010, I was baptized in First Holy Communion and Confirmation. It was uh, wonderful. So, wonderful. yeah. Very, it was still, it's just one of the happiest days, you know, when you're with your classmates. We became yeah. very close as well, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we have about a, about eight minutes left. So, mm -hmm. you know, so you became Catholic. Bring us uh, up to the present. How did, how did, give us a little bit of your, your vocation story yeah. and, and what you're doing now. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I actually entered the convent in a very similar way <laughs> to coming into the church. <laughs> so I felt comfortable looking into religious life because I knew it wasn't going to work out and, but I could look at it and then I could check it off my list, um, go study theology somewhere and, um, and become a third order Dominican and get married and have kids. So that was the plan. But first I had to do this thing because I like couldn't stop thinking about it and couldn't stop talking about it. And uh, apparently it's a red flag when you go on dates with people and just talk about religious life the whole time. So I guess it sends <laughs> the wrong message. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> everything's 2020 in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Um, but I started looking because of the religious I knew they were so happy. Yeah. And I also, I think what I loved more than that was that they were all in I, yeah. at that, the kind of the extreme commitment of religious life was very, very appealing. Uh, but I didn't think I'd ever be able to do it. I really didn't particularly want to live in community. Um, I did not want to live celibately. Um, poverty, eh, I mean, I never made that much money anyway, so, and obedience was definitely not something I was very interested in. Um, but I wanted to know my vocation because once you learn about this love that has been poured into your life and that you are now the temple of not just the Holy Spirit, but, but the, the indwelling of the divine trinity and that you're part of the mystical body, so it's, not just me and my decisions and the things I'm doing, um, you're part of a whole church. And when you become who you're supposed to be by grace, you build up the whole church, right? And I had become very aware that people had helped me become Catholic that I would never meet until heaven, but that their prayers and their sacrifices and their, um, their love for this person they don't know had helped me. And I thought, well, yeah, how, I mean, you have to do that somehow. And then with Mary Magdalene, I knew I wanted to live my life at the foot of the cross, whatever that meant or however it looked. So, um, and I love the Dominicans because I'd received so much from right. them, uh, just extremely generous and very good friends. And uh, I had a wonderful parish, so a lot of support from them uh, in whatever vocation, right? We had a lot of different people, lay consecrated people, married. Um, so I felt like I had a lot of freedom. Um, but I didn't want to teach and I didn't want to be in a cloister. And I thought, well, that pretty much crosses off the whole Dominican thing. So uh, one summer, one of the student brothers came back from his summer ministry and told me about our community. Um, and I immediately thought the same thing I thought when I 
realized I had to be Catholic, which was, oh no, <laughs> this, is, this is not good. Uh, but I had to look uh, because there are Dominicans who uh, didn't teach, but we provide free end of life care for people with incurable cancer who can't afford their nursing care that they need. And our foundress saw the sisters as the women at the foot of the cross who spent their lives consoling the suffering Christ mm. and meeting Christ in the poor and the sick. And I mean, that was just so breathtakingly beautiful. I couldn't ignore it. It's like the Pieta. Um, it's yeah. that, that, that right. image that first struck you. Wow. Yeah, that's like finding out. That was another theme that kind of went through conversion of vocation is just learning what love looks like. Right? You get a lot of ideas of what love is or what it looks like and to find Catholicism and then to find my vocation was learning what love actually looks like. And so I, I visited and I uh, fought it for a while and then couldn't anymore and um, entered in 2013, so fairly quickly after entering the church. And um, it's been kind of like another conversion where you, you relearn how to, how to be yourself and what grace looks like and you're stepping into something that already exists, you're not making it up. And so there's discomfort there, but that's because the Lord is, is at work, kind of accompanying you every step of the way. And, um, you know, living with my sisters and then the guests that we have, they live with us. We take care of them in our home. We don't go out. We, um, we bring them in to us. And to realize, you know, we had a lot of convert friends in D.C. We would all tell each other our stories, you know. Yeah. And um, to realize that every single woman that I live with uh, convert or not has a story and so to see more and more living in community and then taking care of the people we care for that every person has a story of God's work in their life um, and just to be in a really privileged place to to do that and to be with people who are dying which is something our our culture is very uncomfortable with and is uh, I think just such a it's such a privilege because God's entrusting these people who um, don't have anything else and he loves them and he wants them to be with him forever and entrust them to us to help make that happen in whatever way it looks like. The appearance of it is not the main thing. It's, it's to be that constant presence and for me to offer to people what I received coming into the church, which is like nobody waited to love me <laughs> until I was better, right. you know, until I was a better person. Um, and that's hopefully what we offer to the people we care for, which is you come just as you are, and we have people who hate the church, we have people who are not Christian at all, who believe nothing. It doesn't matter. That's They're here because God brought them to us, and our job is to be with them and yeah. to set that groundwork so that they can say yes when they meet right. them. Yeah. We have about two minutes left, but I, one of the things that just comes to my mind throughout your story early on talking about your relationship with the truth, right? And, you know, we have from Scripture that the truth will set you free. And we have to interpret that freedom rightly because we, mm -hmm. we have modern notions of freedom. It's not freedom from, it's freedom for. And that's one thing that strikes me in the story is like, like finally encountering, you know, someone who will talk tr truth, propositional beliefs mm -hmm. with you, finally encountering a real, the, the vivid image of the truth of what love is, opened you up, opened up things that were locked yeah. in you all your life. Right. And the truth really does set us free for. Right. right. Yeah. And yeah. suddenly feeling free, I... Um, I remember thinking that it was so startling that I had lived in this environment where anything goes, right? You can do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. You can believe whatever you want. And I was always so stressed. Yeah. And then if you make a mistake, which you're always doing, like you're always offending somebody somehow in our, you know, our graduate school conversations or it was like, but, but we, none of us believe anything. So why are we, how are we doing this? And then, and then you're not, there's no forgiveness, right? You can't, you're that person who believes X, and that's it. You're done. And then I, I went to what I thought of the most restrictive, um, stodgy <laughs> religion <laughs> in the world and found all of this freedom and all of this forgiveness and all of this, um, I think, affirmation of, of being a woman, of mm -hmm. being somebody who thinks, yeah. of somebody who searches, and that when, not if, when you mess up, <laughs> Right, right. When you don't live according to the grace he's or he's given, when you you try to go out and do it yourself, um, there's forgiveness. Right. Right. There's mm -hmm. real real forgiveness, not mm -hmm. just like well I'll let that go, but like healing, unifying forgiveness. Yeah. You know that 
that was very freeing. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you so much, sister, thank for your story you. and for your work. Um, you know, we uh, ask you and your sister to pray for us. We'll be praying for you in the awesome, you. wonderful work of love that you do with the Hawthorne Dominicans. So again, you can, you can uh, find out more about the Hawthorne Dominicans at hawthorne-dominicans.org. Uh, and so uh, again, I hope you enjoyed and were edified by sister's story. If you go to chnetwork.org, find all sorts of stories just like uh, hers, but from every different background, there's somebody who has a story that comes from a similar place that you are now. So check that out. And once again, this is the Journey Home Program. We'll be back again next week. God bless you.